Hello, welcome to 3 Minutes Engineering Concepts. The idea of this channel is to explain any engineering concept within 3 minutes time. I will be able to explain any fundamental to advanced concept in mechanical engineering and material science. If you like the idea, then please subscribe to our channel and also share our videos and channel details to colleagues and students who can benefit from it. Thank you. Just a recap of what we have done until now. We are now familiar with the equations for the for a truss member and we we can say that it's a 1d 1d structure in a way we are familiar with its kinematic equation which relates the displacements with the strains we also know the constitutive equation which relates the strain with the stresses and we also know how to define the equilibrium equations for the truss element in dynamics and statics the objective of most of the fe analysis analyst is to solve these equilibrium equations which are differential equations and obtain the solution of the field variable so in this case our field variable is displacements other than that what we know is in as i told you before it sometimes it's impossible or very difficult to solve these differential equations for in a complicated geometry or real life structures so we need to use or we need to convert these strong forms into weak form there are different types of energy principles and weighted residual methods which are available as i told you before again and one of them is hamilton's principle which states that if we know the lagrangian functional and small variation of displacement which are admissible displacement should not disturb the whole equation and this means it should be equal to zero what is a lagrangian function we constructed that in the last video which is it is a function of kinetic energy potential energy which is elastic strain energy and the work done by the forces and i gave you the explicit relationships for these energies in terms of density and velocities vectors stresses and strains or strains and elastic constants and also in terms of displacement force concept which is the work done various things so what we're going to do in to, in this video is so the learning in, in a way the learning outcomes from this video would be we will look at the standard FEM procedure using Hamilton's principle for truss members explicitly. And in order to construct the FE equations, the first step, one of the steps is to construct shape functions for the elements. In this case, our element will be a truss element. And those shape functions have to satisfy a few properties. Some of them, one of them is delta function property and the other one is the the partitions of unity property so we're going to discuss that in today's presentation okay the first step in any standard fem procedure using hamilton's principle is to discretize your your domain so in this case if we have say for example a truss structure as shown here then we can divide it into many many truss elements and for example in this case i can divide them into three elements which are shown here as element number one three two and three yeah. and as you can see as well that they are at different angles so their local axis or coordinate system is different than the others because their axial direction is in different orientations so sometimes it requires co coordinate transformation and we're going to cover that but at this point just understand that we divide the geometry into small elements and in this case we are dividing them into smaller truss members or truss elements so in this case we can say any element and or in in the, in the current problem we have three elements in, in a way the prop the problem the procedure of doing this is called meshing in fe, FE world and it's generally is a type of pre-processing action which is taken to, to really divide your domain into smaller elements an element is formed by connecting its nodes so you have nodes at the corners so for example element number one here this one has node 1 and node 2 similarly element 2 has node 1 and node 2 and sim element 3 has node 1 and node 2 which are localized node or which, they, which are their own node numbers while we can also have a global noding node numbering in which like, we can say that node 1 is common in element 1 and 2 node 2 is common for element 3 and 1 and node 3 is common or node 2 is common in element 3 and 2 so again node numbering is also very important and it, and it really helps when you are assembling the global equations because you have equations for each element and then you need to assemble them together which we again will cover later on 
so first thing is just divide the geometry into different meshes or perform meshing operation so in this case what what i'm trying to do here is i just take one element from the the previous figure and i denote it as this one and in this case the length of element is le it has two number of nodes node number one is here here and node number two is here and we assume that the coordinate system is such that the x is basically along the axial direction or along the length of the bar or truss element so this is the first thing we do so as per the truss element definition and depending on the forces which are acting along the axis we can say that in the local coordinate system we only have one displacement and that is in the x direction or axial direction of the truss member which is in this direction which is along x axis and in general depending on the orientation and if we can say that a global system has three different axes then your truss member depending on the orientation can have two degrees of freedom because you can your structure can have two different motions for example uh, to two different components of the displacements and that's why two degree of freedom so now the problem is if we apply a force then there will be some displacement in the element let's say u1 let's say u1 or or u2 because if you have two degrees of freedom in, in y and z direction x and z direction or x and y direction <clears throat> now the problem is if we apply the force our displacement will vary along the length of the element so what you need to do in fe analysis is in any fe element you need to construct interpolation functions which are generally polynomial functions which can interpolate the displacements along the element or throughout the length of the element in this case the total length is le and <clears throat> that's what's done here so my displacement in element anywhere in the element can be given by the interpolation functions we call it bold n and my displacements at the nodes if i know the displacements at the node and if i know my interpolation functions it's these displacements can be boundary conditions for example the nodal displacements which are here and these are the interpolation functions and i can interpolate the displacements anywhere inside my element so my us is approximately the, the approximation of the axial displacement within the element and is the matrix of shape functions and d is the vector of displacement in this case we have two degrees of freedom so we have u1 and u2 so now i'm going to discuss the standard procedure for constructing the shape functions and in this case what you do is you assume that the axial displacement in the truss element which is shown on the right hand side can be given in a general form as a polynomial so for example we can we can assume a linear, non-linear, quadratic, cubic function. In this case, I'm keeping my lab simple and I'm assuming it to be a linear function. So I can say that it varies linearly with this kind of polynomial, where alpha naught and alpha one are coefficients, which again, we need to find the values of those coefficients, unknown constants. While my one and x are the coordinates in this case, and you can see that x will vary from zero to the L, LE, which is the length of the element. So maybe zero is this point, and this point is LE in the coordinate system. And so I denote it as as a as a matrix form in the matrix form as this, that my one my equation in the matrix form will be one x and alpha naught alpha one, and I call it P matrix, P transpose matrix, and alpha matrix. Just two values there. So as I told you, I have only given you the linear elements in this case, or linear interpolation of functions, but you can use any order of polynomial where you can have quadratic or cubic or higher order terms. In deriving the shape functions, we can use the boundary conditions and based on that, we can identify the, these coefficients. So for example, we can say that at x equals to zero, which is somewhere at this point, for example, I can say that x equals to zero, my displacement is u1, and I denote it as u1 here, as you see here. And at x equals to Le, which is this point, my displacement is u2, as shown here. Okay, so that's what I do as here. And what I do, I can just substitute these values in this, these, this equation at the bottom of the screen, and then I try to find the values of alpha naught and alpha. That's what I have done in this case. That's what I have done in this case. And I have substituted these, substituted these values in, in this equation, and I get end up with this kind of equation where u1 u2 equals to 1 0 l 1 le alpha naught and alpha 1 and now in order to find these values i can just take this on the other side 
if I know my displaced nodal displacements as the boundary conditions or whatever, and I can solve for alpha naught and alpha one. So that's what I do. In this case, I just take this on this side. This becomes the inverse, and you can take the inverse of a matrix. Into this is a two two by two matrix, so it's very easy to do, straightforward thing to do. If you're not sure about that, again, I can make a separate video on that, but. I assume that you know how to take an inverse of a matrix even using a calculator. So based on this, my alpha naught and alpha one comes out to be this. So my alpha naught will be one times u one plus zero times u two, while my alpha one will be this term times this plus this term times this. So I will have two equations for two values, two values which means alpha naught and alpha two. So now here what I am doing is I'm just trying to substitute the value of alpha 1 and alpha 2 in my displacement interpolation function and I replace this alpha naught alpha 1 which was this equation with alpha 1 alpha 2 with these things so this whole thing is switched with this this whole term here this whole term here and then I end up with this kind of equation on the, in the screen here which I multiply and simplify and I get the final relationship for ux as this one which is in terms of nodal displacements and the location of my displacement. So in, the, in a way, I have now I have now eliminated alpha naught and alpha one, which were unknown constants, just using the boundary conditions. So as you can see, my displacement function in an element looks something like this, where my first part of this matrix is my shape function, shape function matrix, while these are the displacement matrix at the nodes. So I denote them as nx and de, and this clearly shows me that if my n is has two shear functions because I have two nodes, then my n1 equals to the first term here in the matrix, which is this one, and this that's why it's one minus x over le, while my second shear function is x over le, and in any linear truss element, you will find that all the finite element softwares use these shear functions in local coordinate system. As I told you before, it is very important that any shape functions, whether it's for truss elements, 2D elements, or 3D elements or solids, they have to they have to satisfy two conditions. The first one is called the del delta function properties, and the other one is called the partition of unity. And what is what is meant by partition of unity and delta shape function is that any shape function at its own node, for example, n1 at node 1 will have a one value while it will be zero at all the other nodes. So if you have two, in this case, we have two nodes, but if you have like 10 nodes even, then this shape function, whatever file value it has, it should have a value of one at its own value, at its own node, while it should be zero at the other nodes. And you can see the same for n2. So n2 is one. So I'm just trying to find the pointer here. n2 is one at its own node, which is node two here and it is zero at the other node. So, so this means my function satisfies the delta property. The second one is the partition of unity and it says that the sum of both all the shape functions for an element should be zero at a certain location in the element. So if we are at a location L e equals to zero, this means my n2 is zero, so my n1 is one, so it's one. If I will be somewhere here, then they will be maybe half plus half and it equals to one. And similarly on this side, it will be again one. So sum of all the shape functions should be one. And my element, in this case, my truss element satisfies this. You can also note that the shape functions which are given here and in the plot, they basically give you the shape of the contribution of the nodal displacements at node i. And that is why they are called shape functions. Some of the literature, you will find the terms nzerts. And in some other cases, you might also come across terms like interpolation function, but they are all the same. Also, in this case, the shape functions vary linearly. So you can see it's a linear function rather than a nonlinear function. And it is just because we assume the polynomial to be linear across the element. So therefore, these terms, they are termed as the linear shape function. And hence, this element with these shape functions will be termed as a linear element as shown here. So today I have introduced you to the truss elements and the construction of shape function and its basic properties like partition of unity and delta pro function property and next time we will move forward and we will now start to input these things into our kinetic and potential energy and develop our fe equations for that thank you very much for watching